So Christmas 2021, I had been building an iOS app for five years uh, and I wanted to deploy it to the App Store, but I didn't know how. So I decided that what I was going to do was try to find a simple test app. So I was going to create a new app just to test deployment to the App Store. Uh, this idea of simple was my first mistake. Um, the app that I decided to create that I thought would be really short and simple and easy took me a month, but there you go. So I spent a month building a new app uh, and then I spent another month adding all of the things that Apple wanted me to add in order to make something publishable on the App Store. So that took me to February, two months after I'd had this original idea of building a really small app just to test deployment to the App Store. Um, and I was ready to press the big submit button. I pressed the big submit button. It was very exciting. I waited about 24 hours, I think. And then the email came through and I could see straight away from the preview that it was a rejection. And I was sad. And there were three reasons for the rejection, but the main one was copycats, because in fact, this idea I'd had was not an original idea. And I knew it wasn't an original idea. And I thought that would be OK, because there were many versions of this app on the App Store. Turned out it wasn't OK. So I came up with a brand new idea, which was similar to the original one, could use the original code, but was not a direct clone of other apps. It really was an original idea. And uh, that took me to April. So that's another two months. <laughs> but I've now made another app uh, and I've pressed the big button and I'm waiting and I'm excited and it was rejected. And this time it was rejected because they couldn't find the in-app purchases, which was confusing because I told them how to find them. And they couldn't find the end user license agreement, which was also confusing because I had told them exactly where to go to find it. Uh, but I fixed that. I told them where to find these things. And the in-app purchases failed. But they didn't really tell me how they failed or what I needed to do to fix it or how I could even reproduce the problem that they were seeing. And they also said that they couldn't find the end user license agreement. And I had told them how to find the end user license agreement. So I told them again exactly how to find the end user license agreement. And I pressed the button again and they said, we can't find the end user license agreement. So I told them again and they said again that they couldn't find it. And I was really getting quite upset by this point. Eventually, they managed to tell me that the reason they couldn't find it was because I'd added two locales and it needed to be very specifically in the app description for the US English locale. But they never told me that. And they could have told me that. I wasn't difficult. Anyway, they did tell me that. Um, to cut a long story short, there were many more submissions, many more failures. There were seven submissions. And with all the back and forth, there were 13 rejections trying to get this iOS app onto the App Store. The last rejection was in August, eight months after I started. Um, and actually, that rejection took me way back to the start. It was the, one of the first rejections I'd had that I thought I'd dealt with months ago. And this kept happening, that I kept thinking I'd fix things and then they'd come back to me. To cut a very painful story short, through a process of bad communication and um, bad documentation, a very, very upsetting, depressing roller coaster ride because there were ups, but there were also downs. I almost gave up with this whole process. Not quite. And you're going to have to watch the full version of this talk to find out exactly how the story ended. But what I learned from the whole thing was, um, well, I'm say learned. What it did was consolidate a lot of things that I already knew about how to deliver software. And again, you'll have to walk the, watch the talk to get the full version. But here's a list of the things that I was reminded of through this whole process. The first one is that if you are going to deliver software, it's a really good idea to start with a walking skeleton. So a walking skeleton is a version of the software that does nothing. It's your hello world, but you push it all the way through to prod. 
So you have a deployment pipeline. You have everything you need in order to get something into production because all of the extra bells and whistles, so on the App Store, it's things like a support form and a feedback form and a help page and a whole load, and then end user license agreement. You get all of those things in place before you start developing because you want to know that every version of your app, every functioning version can be deployed. The next thing is the minimum viable product. Have, what is the very, very, very simplest version of your product that can be deployed? Get that out to your users. The other principle is the ability to pivot. So I pivoted twice in this journey. I actually really ended up with three different apps. I pivoted because I realized I was going nowhere, so I did something completely different. Pivoting is a really useful principle, and everything you can do to facilitate pivoting is also really important. One of the things that you can do to facilitate pivoting is to always work in small steps. So G. Paul Hill calls this the many more, much smaller steps, um, MMMSS for short. It minimizes risks if you work in small steps and deploy to prod at every step. Another really useful pr principle is continuous integration, which for me is synonymous with trunk-based development. Again, you're minimizing risk by working in small steps and deploying to prod at every step. Then there's testing. I was not able to easily test in-app purchases. You want everything that's crucial to your product to be easily testable and ideally automatable. And there's innovation. You want people to be able to innovate, which means you want them to be able to take risks, which means you want to build a low risk, low friction development environment that allows people to get new ideas in front of users. Now, the next one will make more sense if you watch the whole talk, but fart apps are a thing. A fart app is an app that makes farting noises, apparently. I haven't, I, I actually don't know why, because I'm now thinking, why have I not looked these things up? But apparently there is such a thing as a fart app. Apparently the app store is flooded with them. And this is why clones get rejected, but they won't tell you that. But the principle is if it's a clone of an existing app and there are too many of them, it's a fart app. The sunk cost fallacy is something that is very relevant to my experience because I sunk a lot of cost into this whole process. And I kept thinking, but I've done so much work on it already, I don't want to waste that work. And that's where the fallacy part comes in, because you believe that because you've spent so much that therefore you should spend more. Actually, no, spending more means losing more. So if you've sunk a lot of cost, but it's going nowhere, stop. User research. So if you can get your product in front of users, then you're going to find out whether you are meeting their needs and desires. And the more quickly you can do that, the more quickly you can respond. And finally, collaboration. We work better when we work together. This was mostly a solo project for me. And one of the things it did was remind me that I probably would have made fewer mistakes and disappeared down fewer rabbit holes if I hadn't have been working mostly alone.